This video was recorded on Thursday, March 9th at Thompson House on McGill University's downtown campus, which is traditional land of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee nations. The keynote speech by David McInnes, coordinator of Canada's National Index on Agri-Food Performance, concluded the Sustainable Food System Solutions Research Fair. This event was part of the University Global Coalition SDG Action and Awareness Week and was co-hosted by the Margaret A. Gilliam Institute for Global Food Security and the McGill Office of Sustainability. want to say before I get into this that how much I enjoyed reading and checking out the, the posters and speaking to some of you. I thought that was really fascinating and for me it was a bit of a canvas about how you're thinking of sustainability, how you're linking it to health um, and social inclusion and uh, just how and the environment and I just uh, was really fascinated by some of your ideas so I, I'm glad I came by early and thank you Patrick and uh, thank you very much, Karen, for having me here. So I'm going to jump right into this. Um, I've got quite a number of slides to share with you, uh, but I think it might give you a pretty good picture as to what this initiative is all about, developing an index on sustainability. Uh, so I hope you enjoy this. It's, it's, there's some detailed slides. I'll try to explain some of them uh, for you if, if you can't see at the back of the room, so I'll try my best. Okay, let's just jump right into this. Uh, it all started with a question. How do we know if Canada's agriculture and food sector is sustainable? And frankly, this is a question that people are posing around the world. But how do we know? Where's, where's the demonstration? Where's the proof of that? This has seized the attention of all of the partners you're going to see in a minute. Um, and also, if, if we do start to have a knowledge of this or understand it, how do we leverage this? So there's actually two questions. Uh, but this is really what we're trying to zero in on. Let me then start with the partners. And uh, Patrick's at 122, and since we spoke, it's now up to 125. And actually, about an hour ago, we had the 126th. Uh, so this represents uh, academia, innovators, it represents uh, three levels of government, four federal departments, seven provincial ministries of agriculture, two municipal initiatives. Uh, it represents social, environmental, indigenous organizations such as Food Banks Canada is a partner. Um, and we also have the Canadian Wildlife Federation, Ducks Unlimited. Uh, plus it represents producers of pork, pulses, horticulture, fisheries, aquaculture, I should not start the list because I know I'm going to leave someone off. Uh, processors uh, and, uh, and retailers, uh, innovation uh, organizations, TELUS Agriculture, Bank of Montreal, Royal Bank, Farm Credit Canada, uh, and, and then we have some of the biggest companies in the world, Danone, Syngenta, Bayer, and others. So this, we also have an insect protein company, I should say, plus upcycling startups and entrepreneurs and venture capitalists. So it's quite a breadth of a coalition. It's quite unprecedented. It's a pre-competitive coalition. Uh, we don't deal with competition issues uh, between the players. Uh, and it's a deep collaboration. And so far it's operated, believe it or not, on consensus, uh, which is, I think, pretty cool. So uh, I know I've left off uh, people. Uh, uh, so I, I dare not even try to, to, to name them all, but uh, they're available on our website if you want to take a look. So what is this crazy group up to? Well, what we're trying to do is respond to what many of you probably well know, and I call this, what's the burning platform? What is the real challenge? Uh, this is a detailed slide, uh, but uh, I think you'll probably understand where I'm coming from. Okay, the global narrative, the view predominantly around the world is that agriculture and food globally is not sustainable, it's not healthy, and it's not inclusive. This is the premise that's informed the SDGs, of which we're celebrating here at UR this week. It's the premise behind the race to net zero, uh, the biodiversity goals, there's a range of social goals. This is the premise for the goals that have been set globally uh, for all countries and players to, uh, uh, to aim to uh, approve, approve upon. This is actually having, in my view, from the perspective that I bring, five huge changes and shifts that are taking place. I'm going to touch on them, 
and bring some examples out just to bring them out, but you're probably well aware of many of them. But let me just get right into it. The first big shift, remember we're thinking in terms of the agriculture and food sector here in Canada, is that this is dictating terms of trade. It's dictating increasingly market access, not exclusively, not always, but it's having a profound shift in the terms of trade of how we export our products around the world and how others do. What's also happening is there's a huge shift in how players are competing. We're talking about how countries position themselves, how companies and supply chains are positioning themselves, and it's also affecting the claims they make about sustainability. I'm going to get all back to this. The third one is everything is being benchmarked. Absolutely everything in the sector from animal care to nutrition, obviously climate uh, performance and environmental performance among many, many other things. Everything's being benchmarked and I'm going to come back to some of these. As a result of this, there's a rising call for the need for standard metrics, standard measures, standardization. We don't have a good idea about what's comparable. We can't compare performance of one to the other. Uh, or, or one supply chain over another uh, and there's a, just a, a, in a way a bit of a positive chaos out there because there's a lot happening that is uh, trying to respond to this but nevertheless there's this need or call for standardization and then the final thing that's coming is something called ESG how many people know what that is here handful okay uh, more than that okay good so ESG is environmental social governance factors these are being driven by the capital markets, financial institutions, securities regulators, uh, uh, large institutions affecting global markets, and they are, because of that chaos and different standards, they are driving ahead on mandatory ESG disclosures. This is going to have a profound impact over time. Anyway, five big shifts, okay? This is what I'm responding to and this is what the coalition is responding to. Uh, and I'm sure there's other things here that we can add, uh, but this is the way we're looking at how this world is unfolding. Okay, I'm gonna doubt, peel away some of these. I'm not gonna read all of this, but this is an example of countries positioning themselves on sustainability. You'll see a variety of countries there. What I think is really cool about this and maybe a little concerning, is that we in Canada feel that we have got one of the most trusted and most sustainable high quality food systems anywhere and we want to promote that brand. Well, so do our friends in Australia, New Zealand, all across Europe, and the Americans are now starting to lean into this value proposition. And that's just touching this. In other words, everyone is positioning and competing themselves and branding themselves on the basis of trust and sustainability. So this is good news if we want to raise the bar around sustainability and the dialogue around it. It's actually an interesting challenge if we want to differentiate ourselves in the marketplace. So this is nevertheless a backdrop. Uh, back in Canada, this is a press release that you, none of you will be able to read, uh, but this was issued about a year ago from the Ministers of Agriculture for the federal government, the provincial and territorial governments. There's a lot of stuff in here, but one that's interesting, sort of speaking to that last slide, is that Canada should be recognized or is recognized as a world leader in sustainable agriculture and agri-food production. Think of all those flags just a side ago. So we're positioning ourselves on this value proposition. And our view, and my view, is that the, and the way we benchmark and measure ourselves actually is the vehicle or the tool to demonstrate this ambition or this vision. And so it's just demonstrating again that here in Canada, we need to come around and embrace an opportunity such as sustainability and trust in the marketplace. Okay, this slide I think is sort of interesting, I'll explain it. On the far left, there is uh, there's a number 89%. And that is when you think of large food processors. So think of uh, anyone that comes to mind, uh, General Mills, Danone, uh, pick, your, pick your company. About 90% of their environmental footprint, that is in this case, their GHG emissions, 90% of their emissions is based in their supply chains. Meaning that if they want to set as they are, and retailers are doing the same, if they want to set targets to reduce their emissions, 
to improve food waste and loss, uh, to improve any number of environmental indicators, most of the impact is embedded in their supply chains. What that is meaning, this is a catalyst for change because processors and retailers need to work with producers to fulfill the commitments they're making to their shareholders, their customers, and the consumer uh, in the marketplace. This is a big shift, a big shift. And if you read through the sustainability reports for a McDonald's or any number of these large companies, you'll see what they're doing to work with producers to hit those targets that they're making in the marketplace. The reverse is true. The other uh, uh, box is about the dairy farmers and grain growers in this country, among others, uh, that they too are setting bold targets on emissions and environmental impact. But for them to hit those targets, they need to work with others too. NGOs, government, companies. The point being, and I think this is sort of the positive part of the story, um, among many others, of course, but one of the positive parts is that by setting targets, it's creating a need for better evidence and a genuine pursuit of collaboration. This is not just, we're gonna work with you and it's put in a press release. This is genuine because those targets are forcing a new discipline of change. This is a slide that talks about how Canada is being benchmarked. Remember I said we want to be known as a trusted, safe, sustainable food supplier, uh, among others. Well, this is how our friends from abroad actually measure us. Uh, we're 64th, according to the EPA, which is an Environmental Performance Index by, developed by Yale University, and 36th by The Economist Impact, uh, formerly the EIU. Uh, what's interesting about those two measures is that sort of does sort of stands in contrast to the fact that we actually are a very sustainable food producer. So what's up? Well, it has to a lot to do with the type of methodology. It may have to do with practice-based measures the versus outcome-based measures. Canada the point G7 that really is major the issue here is that even if we as, as a country as a don't trust to do anything about the measures measuring ourselves, that we're we will be continued to be measured. This is uh, an that area is the that key I think here. has uh, the last one among these other initiatives. This is not specific to agri-food. This is about Canada as a whole, and, and this is about how Canada is performing. And this is a new organization. I think it's actually based in Montreal uh, that has been set up called the International Sustainable Sustainability Standards Board. This has come out of the Task Force on Climate Disclosures, a global initiative to understand what is the impact of climate on uh, the financial services industry. And the IISSB is basically setting a global baseline for ESG disclosures, which as you see has been endorsed by a broad number of countries, including Canada. This is having a major impact on what's going to happen, or will have a major impact on what's going to happen around how we disclose climate risk and opportunities uh, across the financial services sector. And if you want to create change, capital markets are a key way or a vehicle to do that. So an example of this is that uh, here in Canada, the uh, Canadian Securities Administrators, they regulate the securities market, the stock exchanges. Uh, the American SEC, SEC is doing the same thing. They are committing to the net zero plan. They in turn are requiring financial institutions, banks, to also have a plan. Banks in turn are setting their targets to, in this case, net zero. And what are they doing? Remember that slide about the supply chain working together? They're now applying the same rigor to their portfolios. They're starting with their corporate borrowers. What is your sustainability risk? What is your climate exposure? What are the opportunities so we can invest? And they're starting now to grade their largest borrowers and this will change things. Ultimately, what will happen is that this will then push down into the mid-size uh, level and below. And it's got a long way to go, but this is truly transformational if it works. Now, there's questions here about the comparability of data, the definitions of this. Uh, what are you truly measuring? Put that aside for a minute, but just think of the players involved in agriculture and food are no longer the producer, the processor, the retailer. It's the financial markets. That's a big shift. Okay, all of that's going on above us. 
then there's a lot of stuff happening below around uh, what commodity groups, producers, and companies are doing and provinces. And what we're doing is going, wait a sec, how do we reconcile these global changes with these local and national changes? And can we do something around how we benchmark or measure ourselves? And that's where the national index is coming in, which I'm going to get into. All right, so this is what it looks like, at least the, the first part. Uh, you can see there's four blocks of sustainability. The environment, of course, uh, we include the economy. You have to have profitable farms and profitable companies to have sustainable, to, to be sustainable over the long term. Societal well-being, I'm going to get into what these mean, is about things like workforce and food security and other things. But we've added another block. And if you think of the way the SDGs are structured and ESG, and, and it's really building on the people, profit, planet, and adding another leg or block to the stool, and that's food security, or excuse me, food safety, and other things that we call food integrity. You cannot have a sustainable food system if you don't have a safe food system. So we added that block. This is what we're structuring around, and I'm going to get into this in some gory detail for you. So this is what we're doing. We are trying to measure on a consolidated basis, which I'll elaborate, a national picture of sustainability from agriculture, production, which includes fisheries, to retail, food service, grocery, restaurant. We're measuring against these four blocks. We're looking at outcomes-based metrics as much as possible. This is a higher form of evidence versus practice-based. I'm going to come back to that. And this is about showing progress against national and global goals. And essentially, it's about how do we align this very big sector, very diverse sector, to step up disclosures and leverage that for value. That's what we're trying to do. But in order to take on this task, we had to put boundaries. And so there's things that we're not doing. And they are, this is not prescriptive. We're not saying to a farmer, a producer, this is what you need to do. We are not comparing to other countries. We'll leave that to those other, uh, those other vehicles. We're not scoring people. And this was a big decision. We're not saying that Canada or a jurisdiction like a province or a company or a producer gets a, a B plus or an A minus or whatever that is, because that requires us to get access to data that we simply don't have. And uh, that's just not where we're gonna go. And we're not measuring consumer diets. And this was a tricky one. And you'll see when I get into the societal well-being is that we're not measuring what a healthy sustainable diet is We're not picking between the proteins. We're not saying that this protein is better than that. That's not our task uh, And over time we hope to uh, get into greater granularity uh, Once we get better data by the way, one of the reasons why we didn't get into the consumer diet piece is you start to get into as I was saw it around the, some of the posters, you start getting into education policy. Uh, you start getting into economic policy. You certainly get into health policy. That's a, you know, that's a lot of policy areas to start measuring. We're staying focused on agriculture and food. And so I'll explain a little bit where some fuzziness is uh, in, our, uh, in our work coming up. So this is what we're trying to do. The value of benchmarking and presenting that picture, there's probably many, but here are some top line ones. In the marketplace, if you're able to back up what you say about sustainability, the sustainability claims that are being made, then this is about enabling competitiveness in the marketplace, both here and in our export markets. And this is about the brand that I talked about earlier. For capital markets, that is for financial institutions and raising investment, it's a way to provide a context of risk Overall, we're not uh, affecting the credit score of an individual firm because we're not measuring an individual sustainability profile, but context around risk and opportunity around improving those financial disclosures. In policy, better data certainly informs policy making, strategy, research ideas and innovation priorities. If we want to be more sustainable, like I saw around here, uh, how we engage researchers around those priorities is really important. And ultimately, if you acknowledge the shortcomings, if you understand that we're not perfect, uh, you note where we need to make progress on societal or environmental objectives or priorities and goals. Um, that transparency is important to just simply build trust. This is the value drivers. 
quite a phase of work has been underway. Uh, we started, I'm not going to go through all of this, but we started in early 2020. We're now in our phase three, the pilot development phase. It's going to come to a conclusion soon. And that's leading to setting up a center to take this work on, a modest size center to take this on and evolve it so that we can go from the pilot 1.0 to a 2.0 and a 3.0 and make it more sophisticated and better with better data. That's where we're going. We've issued a whole lot of reports. They're on our website. You can check out all this. We've used these reports to build a, a dialogue amongst the partners, really important, to engage global stakeholders. You'll see that next. And also to firm up our ideas of what's in scope and what's out of scope. How do we operate? What are our principles? How do we live those? And so this work actually was really important to, to glue that coalition together. Those are very disparate, diverse interests. And so we worked really hard in terms of how we set this up and it took time, uh, but that's, these reports are very important. Plus it's good for transparency and being making sure we're open about what we're doing. Anyway, that's, uh, that's our process. You can't see this at the back, I don't think, uh, but we worked really hard and engaged global organizations from the FAO, the European Commission, the Food System Dialogues, the World Business Council on Sustainable Development, the World Benchmarking Alliance, and so on and so forth. They came in and had informal dialogues. They were really interested in what we were doing and we felt that it became really important for them to have a little, high, a little stronger rigor in that discussion. They actually re reviewed our draft indicators under development in the last phase. We also worked with universities to do a review, a review as well and that information was really helpful. We changed stuff, we, we uh, uh, changed tone and wording and we overall made uh, some impro many improvements frankly in the work because of all this. The point being here is that while even though the coalition brings a lot of diversity uh, in the, and blended uh, sort of input, you need that external discussion to make sure that you're thinking about this right, as right as you possibly can. In this phase, which is going to be reporting in May, we've even gone deeper. We've reached out, we didn't bring them into the dialogue, but we had, uh, we had a consultant help us by assessing how all of these standards and, and global indices are actually being how our indicators line up against them. And what it's done is it's allowed us to say, hey, these other entities, they measure things differently, but different doesn't mean that they're better. And there are areas where we may be not so good. And there are areas where we exceed what's happening. The point is it's a whole learning experience about understanding about how we measure things. It's also created a bit of a checklist for us about things that we need to address going forward. So anytime you bring in this external discussion, external reference, I think it's totally healthy. Um, and it's, we've learned a whole lot. One of the actual interesting parts about it is many of the global initiatives measure practices uh, and processes, which are very important, whereas we're trying to emphasize as much as we can our outcomes, which is evidentiary. So that's a bit of a difference. Uh, we're not perfect there because of data gaps, but that's sort of where we're going. Okay, so this is what the index actually looks like as published in May. So you see we have those four blocks of sustainability. Across those four blocks, and I'll read some of this out because you won't be able to see them, uh, we have the environment and there are seven indicators, GHG emissions, soil health, water, biodiversity, inputs, which are fertilizer and pesticide, uh, food loss and waste, plastics and packaging. And behind the list of indicators, there's all sorts of, uh, uh, which we phrased here, sub-indicators. We're sort of moving away from some of the taxonomy, some of the language to streamline this. But we have uh, a whole whack of individual metrics uh, representing each one. The point is, is that we have 20 indicators across the four blocks and well, there are well over 100 metrics, which are not shown actually here. So this is the index that we proposed in May, working with those coalition of partners at the time in many, many, many Zoom calls, which was actually a, a benefit, frankly, working virtually than trying to bring everyone together, uh, uh, ironically. Um, and now we're trying to find the data 
to basically populate all the metrics. That's the phase we're in now. Find the data that's suitable data to populate the metrics. Okay, I'm just going to go through this very quickly. So let's start with societal well-being here. Uh, this is about uh, the workforce. You need a sustainable, uh, so a sustainable workforce. What I mean by that is it's about workplace safety. It's about how do you attract and retain people. How do you uh, how do you help educate people? The workforce is essential, obviously, to any industry, any 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 entity. Uh, and we try to measure that. We also get into the issue of food security versus insecurity. So food security is a huge issue. It's about everything. It could be about rail transport. It could be about policies. It could be about uh, how you educate uh, the, the population. It is, it, it's, it's about everything. So. We can't measure everything. We got to stay focused to agriculture, food, and so we looked at some uh, indicators of food insecurity, uh, accessibility, and affordability. Uh, and there's some indigenous aspects in here around food sovereignty, but there's really not a lot of data about that. Nevertheless, we're working with our indigenous partners around how this might be something to uh, dig dig deeper on in the future. And we also measure uh, animal care uh, as part of this particular block. So lots of different things in here, and I'm just sort of going by real fast for you. Then we look at something called food integrity, and this is about uh, food safety. And we came across a data point that previously I had never seen before, because how do you prove, demonstrate that this is a safe food, uh, food system? Well, we found a data point uh, uh, published by the Canadian uh, uh, CFIA, the Canadian Food and, uh, Inspection Agency, I got it, um, and, uh, and they do regular uh, sampling and found that well over 98% of the food supply that's tested uh, is, uh, is safe. And this is a key data point because it allows us to, to pull data together. This is one advantage of this index is that previously the data points are sort of dispersed all over the place and now we're able to pull it together to give a comprehensive view. We also uh, look at uh, nutrition. <coughs> this is where we get a little uh, practice base ourselves. So what we do is we focus on process matters. Is there a nutrition facts table? Is there a Canada food guide? So we understand uh, our limitation and measurement here. Um, we look at traceability and food labeling. labeling. What we really emphasize is the caliber of the, um, of the inspection, surveillance and regulatory framework as a pillar uh, for how uh, we can uh, lay claim to around safe and, and food and have high food integrity. Then we look at the environment. This of course is the big one in terms of the number of much uh, the span of it. Uh, but we look at uh, climate change. There's actually really good data in Canada about producer level of emissions, but where we lack is that supply chain view and having a good picture of emissions across the supply chain. For pesticides and fertilizer, what's really interesting is we don't have good data on environmental impact. We've got, we use sales-based data to be a proxy for impact. That's not where we want to be to respond to a marketplace that wants to know about what's happening. Um, and there's some, some other examples too around food waste. Now we don't monitor consumer food waste because I mentioned to you that this isn't consumer facing. It's not about measuring consumer be behaviors and habits. So that's where that fence is again. But we do address a number of issues that are certainly central to it. So you can get this sort of drift here as to where we're going. And then finally we include economic. And well, this is sort of a bunch of leading and lagging indicators. Lagging is we want to document just how important this sector is to the economy. How many jobs are in food manufacturing, uh, one in five. More than the automotive sector, by the way. Uh, we want to make sure we understand the economic contribution. Those are lagging indicators. Leading indicators are what is going to move this economy, this agri-food economy, to respond to a changing sustainability world. So we look at sustainable finance. We look at R&D spending and other things like infrastructure investments. This is needed to be a more sustainable food system to march us along that road to net zero. So as you can see, I'm not covering everything. But together, we're trying to provide a holistic view of sustainability. 
So what's next? Well, right now we're sourcing the data for the pilot. And what we're finding is that there's a whole lot of data that we need or the data is not suitable, it's not of the right quality that we are looking for. There are data gaps all over the place. But one of the big benefits of this process in my mind was not only harnessing this coalition to come up with the 20 indicators, was also to drive consensus on what the data gaps are. That is a huge public policy uh, uh, benefit in my view, and this will serve us well going forward. We're also developing some interpretation of results. Remember that I mentioned that academic and that global feedback? One of the things that came through clearly is be careful of greenwashing. And you know the coalition, they want to talk about how sustainable they are. So how do we reconcile talking about leadership and how well we're doing without sort of slipping into language that may be perceived to be greenwashing or being, well, just not quite on, on track? Well, we, so that feedback we really heard. And so rather than interpreting the results and embedding that in the index pilot material itself, we're going to write a few interpretive papers, very short, and, and keep the narrative separate from the index pilot itself. I hope that works. It's a technique that we're working on right now, but we want to keep the commentary separate from the measures, hopefully to insulate ourselves from the, any risk of greenwashing. We're also applying this index even while we're building it. So for example, Manitoba Food and Beverage, which represents uh, SMEs in that province and food processors, they're already looking at how to apply it within their membership. Uh, we have uh, researchers in Western Canada that are applying this work, even though this pilot is not yet launched, uh, among some other examples. And I think this is encouraging. I think people are trying to see how can we take this index framework and apply it because everyone is in the same position. Everyone. And that, or will be. And that is, how do we demonstrate sustainability over time and our progress? Uh, some don't have to. Some may prefer not to here and abroad. But this is where the marketplace, this is where society is going. And so uh, how we apply it, I think, can be very helpful. The final thing that we're doing is we're planning for our future. So this pilot material is going to be coming out um, early May. Um, and now we're setting up for that center that I mentioned, this modest or reasonably small group to take this work and evolve it. How do we take the pilot and step it up to version 2.0? How do we start to triage those data gaps so that we can deepen our understanding on some of the priority issues that we identify? How do we have the right balanced decision-making and governance process so that social and environmental groups um, and small organizations can be at the same table but have a common voice and a shared opportunity for input? So we have a whole governance program. We're looking at how do we, uh, how do we tap into aggregated data. We don't want to reach back to the farmer or the company. That's not our intent. But maybe we can better source aggregated data from third parties, provincial governments, academia. And what's the process, though, to ensure comparability, that confidentiality? If it's aggregated, well, that probably takes care of that. But how do we deal with that? So we're coming up with ideas about how to source data in the future. And then how do we leverage this again for value, whether it's in policy or research or in the marketplace? That's all what's in coming up, and hopefully this can kick off uh, in the fall. And then finally, um, I'd be interested from you. How can the Emerging Index actually become a lens for you to consider what you're working on? Uh, this is not meant to be for a large corporation or a big government. This is designed to be applicable, really tell anyone how they're assessing their sustainability performance and how they best measure, report, and communicate that. And I'd be interested to hear what your thoughts might be. So with that, I'm going to stop and uh, I guess to be open for a discussion or get your input. So thank you very much.